and present. Um, okay, in terms of, for this week, um, our special occasions, that which means for us birthdays, anniversaries, and you can tell us whatever else you have. We have a long list, so let me get into it. First off, there's DP Marcel Boyce, who celebrates his birthday tomorrow, um, the 19th. Um, on the 19th, we also have um, the anniversary of P.T. Eric Malcolm and Judith. So to, the 19th, which is tomorrow, is their anniversary. And one of the persons who, I mean, everyone who we have any contact with at Kiwanis Club of Kingston is near and dear to our hearts. But there's this lady, Marie, who happens to be the wife of DP Chris, um, Chris Robinson. Tomorrow, the 19th, will be her birthday. So happy birthday to her when it comes. Um, Kiwanian Von Gawin White celebrates his birthday on the 20th. Um, also, Another person, well, I should have left him for last, but I'll say no anyway, since I'm trying to go in order. The gentleman you're seeing on your screen there, President, right? Um, on, the, on the 21st, it is the, and the, the birthday of Jacqueline. And you're wondering who is Jacqueline? She's the wife of PP past president Victor McFarlane. And we also have DP Leo Chung celebrating his birthday on the 22nd, as well as Kiwanian George Beckford for the 22nd. No, there is one special lady, and I hope I am right. So DLG Willie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but had she still been with us the 20th, of the month would have been the birthday of Shirley Reason. So that's correct me if I'm wrong, dear G. Willie. That's correct. It, will, it is so. Correct. Yes. All right. So even though she may not be, be, be hearing yes. us, she was so special to us. We still have to say to her, happy birthday. Thank you very um, much. I, I, I would like at this point to, to ask anyone who is celebrating any special occasion, any birthday, anniversary, any special occasion at all that you'd like to share with us please just through president junior i'm asking you to just open your microphone let us know so we can we can celebrate with you anyone okay well it's back to you president junior um i, I don't know if it would be disrespectful to say back to the birthday boy but in two days time that's what it will be <laughs> back to you sir thank you very much D. My birthday will be on the 20th, yes, just like with his wife, Mrs. Reeson. So we have something there very special together. The twin. Mm -hmm. Right, right, Willie? That's correct. That's why we are so, so good friends. That's right. <laughs> All right. We we'll, we'll move the apologies, uh, recognition of birthdays. Right. All right. There are some birthday celebrations in the chat, uh, Secretary. Shana K, from you? 23 CSO, celebrating birthday today, and Chairman Avian's birthday was yesterday. Oh, I know that there was something special with Chairman Avian. All right, thank you. Any other? Secretary Shana K, from 23 CSO. Yes. Okay. Quite a bit around this time, isn't it? Happy it's birthday. Singer. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, all. Happy birthday. Yes. Happy Everybody birthday. Can raise a happy birthday to Shana Key. Right. Happy birthday to all of us. Thank well, you. Let me. Okay, go on, DLG. You were saying something, DLG? Yes, we should raise happy birthday to Shana Key. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. All of you know, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Praise for the lady. Everybody just remember that this is a men's club, so we're not too good on the singing. On the singing. Yes, that's my child. Some very good men singers, you know. Yes. This is T. Ramston, you're on, right? Thank you for being with us. 
And I think I said I saw the LGE Trevor on as well. Thank you for being with us, Trevor. Thank you, President. I, I was at a meeting with our, our sons and daughters, Mona um, Barbican. Okay, that's good. Very interesting topic. Good, good, good. Very. LG, very. Trevor, you're on, you're still on? He's there. He's there. I know that he's there. Okay, so we'll move to QAnis Q education. LGD. Thank you. Thank you, President Junior. Right, right. Good evening again, fellow Kiwanians, SLP members and guests. I'm glad to see CKI members in the house. In recognition of CKI week, which is October 17 to 21, um, this Kiwanis education is really to tell us a little bit more about CKI. CKI, which is the term that they want us to use rather than circle K, is the world's largest student-led collegiate service organization with 13,835 members on hundreds of campuses in five continents. This collegiate branch of Kiwanis International Family is committed to developing leaders by offering unique service, leadership, and fellowship opportunities that not only change the world, but change members' lives and communities. Its members are dedicated to childhood development, environmental justice, serving those who are food insecure or lack housing and mental health. They also partner with UNICEF to raise awareness to the needs of clean drinking water globally. This SLP or Service Leadership Program, as it is, of Kiwanis International, which was founded in 1936, promotes service, leadership, and fellowship as its three precepts to regulate behavior and thought. Its motto is, live to serve, love to serve. That is it for Kiwanis Education, President Junior. Very good. President, President Junior, if, if I may, sir, before you go on, just, just acknowledge the presence of faculty advisor extraordinaire Ali Douglas, the LG Eileen, and the LG Gert Gertlin. Thank you very much. Good to join you. Have a great meeting, everyone. Stay safe. You're, you're muted, President Junior. Yes. So good, very good evening again, and we'll move to our guest speaker I saw online earlier. And um, Chairman Garfield, Blake, will do the introduction for us at this time. Chairman, are you on? Yes, I'm on. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Good evening to you. Yes. Abigail Evans, biographer. Abigail Evans is a mental health advocate who works as an administrator and research officer with the Jamaica Mental Health Advocacy Network. She serves as a director for Think Mental Health Jamaica and works with Safe Spot Jamaica, Jamaica's first child health plan. She is passionate about educating and advocating for the importance of mental health care on a broad scale and advancing mental health policies in Jamaica. Abigail holds a bachelor's degree in psychology and management studies and has received training in counseling children and young people on helplines. She hopes to pursue a master's degree and or doctorate in clinical psychology. 
with a special interest in psychopathology, treating trauma and organizational management. Her work also includes public speaking engagements on the topic of mental health. Fellow Kiwanians and guests, please help me welcome Ms. Abigail Evans. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Ms. Evans, are you on? Good evening. Hi, good evening, everyone. Oh, there you are. <laughs> All right. Um, could someone make me the co-host so I can share my screen, please? Sure, let me do that. Yes. Um, yeah. In the meantime, the piece while it's ready, it's really okay. It's okay. Okay, it's on. Okay, let me just. All right, are you seeing the slides? Yes, we're seeing the slides. All right, awesome. All right, so good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about mental health. Good. So I am Abigail Evans. I am a mental health advocate and I am from the Jamaica Mental Health Advocacy Network. So our vision is really to see a mentally healthy society in Jamaica. We do this by promoting mental wellness through advocacy, education, research, and service. So what is health? I think we all have an idea of what health is, physical, mental, social well-being, the absence of disease and illness, and just being well on a whole. But we at Jamhan, that's short for the Jamaica Mental Health Advocacy Network, we're saying to be healthy. This is holistic wellness we're talking about. Mental wellness has to play a role. So what is mental health? So this is everyone's business. One in five adults throughout their lifetime has experienced a mental health concern throughout their life. I can even remember a conversation with my brother. So he watches football, right? I'm, I'm sure some of the men here also watches football. Um, he was saying, you know, this mental health is, is really a serious thing because he was watching Premier League the other day and they were talking about mental health. So usually they talk about racism and other issues affecting the players, but now mental health has entered the conversation. So persons, persons all over the world are realizing that it is a serious concern that everyone should be paying attention to. And it is just as important as our physical health because it affects our daily lives. So how we feel, our ability to do work, go to school, and even to get along with others, and just how we can take care of ourselves and take care of other people. So I want, to think, I want you to think about how you're feeling right now especially as it regards to your mental health. So where do you fall on this continuum? So are you in the blue? Are you mentally well right now? Everything is good. Or maybe you're, you're crossing over into the green and maybe the yellow. So maybe work stress you out today. Maybe family members stress you out today, you know? And then what persons normally think of is mental illness down to the orange. So to be mentally healthy. So when we say mentally healthy, what does that look like? So it's having a sense of contentment. I'm not saying you're always going to be happy. That is impossible. That's not what mental health is. It's that you recognize that, you know, sometimes you'll be stressed. Sometimes you'll have problems. But can you bounce back from it? Do you have strategies in place when you're having your mental, when you're having, when you're, you know, you're feeling a little low? Do you have a sense of purpose and meaning? Do you know what you're working for? Do you know what you're living for? Are you able to learn new things? Are you flexible enough to learn new things, adapt to change? We had a pandemic. All of us had to adapt. How did you deal with that? Are you able to balance work and play? So we all know we have to work. So during the week, you work your 40 hours or more. But what do you do on the weekends? Do you continue working? But does that really serve you? And then it's the building and maintaining fulfilling relationships. So we all have friendships, all have relationships, but are they fulfilling? Do they fulfill you do, or do they exhaust you? 
are you enthusiastic about seeing these people? Are you enthusiastic about talking to them? Do they help you? Do you help them? What kind of relationships do you have in your life? That's what we mean by mentally healthy. These things and more, because it looks different for everyone. What is mental illness? So this is what most people think when they hear mental health. But as you can see, there's a difference. So these are disturbances in your thoughts, your behavior. And what happens with mental illness? You're unable to cope with the demands of your life. So if you're a mother, if you're a father, if you're a son, you cannot fulfill your roles. If you need to work, you probably cannot work. And these, are, these last for maybe two weeks or more. And sometimes it can come about as stress or other traumatic events. And sometimes it is physical as well as emotional and psychological. So there's a thing we call psychosomatic symptoms where your mental, where your mental illnesses may manifest physically. So you're having heart palpitations, maybe you're sweating, maybe you can't sleep, um, getting up during the night, and maybe you're anxious, so your hands are shaking. Those are mental challenges manifesting physically. It can be caused as a result of a number of things. It's, it's never one thing. So your environment. So what kind of environment are you in? Your genetics, so, you know, family, your parents, and just the imbalances in your brain. And it can affect anyone at any time. So in Jamaica, the most common mental health challenges are depression, anxiety, psychosis, which is, which is schizophrenia. We normally have schizophrenia as our psychosis. So over 30% of the adult population is currently living with depression and the rates may have increased, especially due to COVID. And I want to point out dementia, especially for persons over the age of 60. So the WHO, that's the World Health Organization, they say by, by 2050, 131 million persons are expected to develop dementia in low to mid middle income countries, so like Jamaica, the Caribbean, and Latin America. And of that, 90 million, 90 million, that's gonna exist in the Caribbean and Latin America. So look at those numbers. So of the 90 million, 90 million of 131, we're gonna be developing dementia. And we have to take that seriously, and especially as our population is aging, our persons are getting older, and dementia is gonna be, well, currently is a real concern for us. So a part of what Jamhan does is research. One of our research projects, Stra Jamaica, has recognized this. So I want to point out that dementia, it is not a normal part of aging. So it's normal to forget things sometimes. All of us do it, even me in, at my age, it is yeah. normal. But so not be able to recognize your family members, that is not normal. And currently, there's a suspected case of maybe over 41,000 and growing persons who have dementia in Jamaica. And you know, dementia does not only affect the person, but the family members, the caregivers, everyone around them. So depression, I want to point out that depression is not just feeling sad. It's a persistent feeling of sadness. And as I said, with mental illness, it has to affect your daily life. So are you able to work? Are you able to go to school? You know. With depression, there's a feeling of hopelessness. There's a loss of interest. So if you're a person who normally watches TV, normally go out with your friends, normally join activities like the Kiwanis and are an active member, you now find yourself that, you know, you're no longer feeling enthusiastic about doing these things. You're withdrawing from your friends. You're withdrawing from your families. You're sleeping too much or sleeping too little. And we have suicidal ideations. So those are just suicidal thoughts. And as I mentioned, Mental health challenges can manifest physically. So chest pains, sleeping problems, aching muscles and joints, and even digestive problems. These are some of them, <clears throat> sorry. So these are some of the symptoms I just mentioned, the sadness changing in sleeping patterns. There's also eating patterns and the desire to participate in activities and withdraw. Now I have to point out that this, with these illnesses, you have to think about the person, who the person was before and who they are now. So this is a person that's normally outgoing, normally social, and now they're withdrawing. Now that's a time you, you know you must pay attention. And not a person who is normally um, bubbly, but now they're irritable about everything. They're always moody. So these are things you have to consider. So now with suicide, 
thankfully, Jamaica has a relatively low suicide rate. But in recent times, especially with the pandemic, where depression and anxiety has doubled, our younger persons and even children and teenagers are experiencing more suicidal thoughts. And some have, have even admitted to attempting suicide. And on the flip side, we have older persons, 60 and older, they're, they are also depressed which you know, can lead to suicide. And depression, we have to be mindful of that because depression is a risk factor for dementia. So post-traumatic stress disorder, which is PTSD, the literature, literature and statistics don't necessarily say, necessarily talk about PTSD, but private counselors, they realize that this is an issue, especially with you know, the Jamaican context. The Jamaica, we have a very high crime rate. So you, someone you know, me, would have likely experienced or see or know someone who has experienced trauma or a violent traumatic event. And the thing is why it doesn't even seem like a big deal to us. We're so desensitized to it. But it does affect us. It affects our children. It affects adults. It affects how we respond to conflict. You know, someone step on someone's toe, someone just bounce into somebody and they're flaring up. These are some symptoms of PTSD. There's a lot going on around us and it does affect us. So one of the big disorders, schizophrenia, this is what persons normally think about when they hear mental health, you know, mad people on the road, homeless people. This is schizophrenia. So it's a chronic and severe mental disorder. It places a heavy burden on the person's life. It's hard for them to live. It's hard for them to find jobs. It's hard for them to be educated. They are at a higher risk for substance abuse problems, at even, at even health problems. So, so they are likely to develop a heart disease in the future and other kind of conditions. And I want, yes. So these are some images of what we normally think when we hear about schizophrenia and homeless persons and just them being stigmatized. So with impacts on family, as I mentioned, the stigma, frustration so dealing with someone with schizophrenia is really hard not just for the person itself who's experiencing so much because it's schizophrenia they are having hallucinations and illusions which are two different things hallucinations are when your senses basically trick you so you're not seeing reality you're not hearing reality and delusions you're not believing reality so you may be paranoid you may you may be paranoid you may think people are out to get you that's what i mean by hallucination versus delusions um, there's also the financial strain because the cost of medication, even though I mentioned that NHF does cover some of the costs, there's still other costs. Um, then it's just the alienation they feel, they're stigmatized and discriminated against. And it's really hard for the family members, especially when they have to take care of them fully. So the causes are not really known. It's never just one thing. It's a combination of things. So biology, their genes, family members, environment, whatever is happening around them, their family, their friends, in their homes, and brain chemicals as well. So there's been a noticeable gender difference in schizophrenia. So men tend to develop schizophrenia earlier than women, normally at 18. And for women, it's in their mid-20s. So as I mentioned, schizophrenia is the most prevalent disorder in Jamaica. The exact prevalence is not really known. Again, some persons may have some symptoms, but they may not go in to get the official diagnosis. And those are numbers that you know, we're counting the official diagnosis. And as I said, medication is available through public health services, but you know, there's more to be done. And I spoke a little bit about the symptoms, the hallucinations, the delusions, disorganized speech. So they may not be making sense to you. They're saying words, but the words do not connect. And their behavior, as I said, sometimes they may be a bubbly person, they may be outgoing, they know they're withdrawn. They're just not themselves. I want to play this audio for you. I hope it's loud enough. This is someone's, this is a person who has schizophrenia and this is their story. I am living with paranoid schizophrenia and my identity. Is everyone hearing? I heard something, but... Is it loud enough? It, it went just now. Paranoid schizophrenia 
and my identical twin brother is diagnosed with hemophrenic schizophrenia. My brother and I have five siblings between us. I was hospitalized and put on the back burner by my brothers, but not my mother and one sister. We were never introduced to their friends when they came around. Unfortunately, we were considered the dregs of society and thought to have no use, although we were very bright in high school. My brother wanted to become a doctor and I wanted to become a lawyer. And we were on our merry way until at age 19, destruction struck when we had the first episode. This was two weeks from our 20th birthday and it was the most unwelcome birthday present ever. This day, my brothers disassociated themselves from me, although I've only had two episodes in 36 years. We are from a brilliant family academically, where none of us have less than five, six mm -hmm. subjects, and most of us attended a tertiary institution. Though mm -hmm. as students, we shared everything and were similarly diagnosed. We both lived with the diagnosis very differently. Mm -hmm. I am a civil servant who is contributing significantly to society. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, our mother, our major cheerleader and champion, died my brother to endure the agonies in the world without her loving support. My twin brother remains in poor health and has not found a treatment program that works for him. I prefer to remain anonymous because I am aware of the possible implications and troubles associated with my disclosure. I take my medication on a daily basis. I am classified as a high performance patient. My brother and I have endured more hardships <clears throat> to our illness. Unfortunately, people seem to fear what they do not understand. But yet, I remain hopeful that by sharing my story, I can give strength to others and contribute to reducing the negative stigma surrounding mental illness. Yes. I hope everyone was able to hear it, but that was just someone's story about their personal experience with schizophrenia. And his twin brother also has schizophrenia. So right. he's what you call high functioning. So he's able to take his medication, go to counseling and work and have a, what you call a normal life. While his twin brother, twin brother has, you know, struggles a bit more. So he has more incentive instances of psychotic breaks and uh, his family, he has to rely more on his family. So it's schizophrenia, sometimes with the proper help, proper medication, counseling, you persons can eventually move on and have a meaningful life, even while living with schizophrenia. So in these instances, uh, with the depression that I mentioned, with the anxiety, with uh, the schizophrenia, with the PTSD, who can you call for help? So the reality is that the system is underfunded, under-resourced. And for a time, yes, that's the reality. It's underfunded, under-resourced, but there are some resources. Especially with the pandemic, it has shone a light on the deficiencies in our system. So we have the Ministry of Health. They have a mental health and support unit. If there's an emergency moment, you can call these numbers that are on the screen. There is Choose Life. That's for persons who have attempted or thinking of committing suicide. We have the Mensa Group for mentally ill and their caregivers. We have the Community Upliftment for the mentally ill. This is in Montego Bay. And then different public clinics have mental health days. The thing with public clinics, you know, they're going to take long. You have to wait and get a number. But there are some resources there. For our time, we know that Jamaican police, they don't necessarily know how to deal with these persons. For a time, the Ministry of Health did try to train them up to be equipped to deal with mental illness, but a number of things happen. Jamaican police can be resistant to changes, and just generally, Jamaicans are resistant to any kind of mental health concerns. And then the police has a high turnover rate. So those who would have been equipped with knowledge, equipped with the knowledge they went away with that knowledge. We also don't really have much rehabilitation centers, you know, for drug, those who abuse drugs. And, uh, but the thing is, fortunately, we have psychiatrists at every public hospital. So we have UA with War 21, and we have Bellevue's and the various public hospitals. There's usually a psychologist, psychiatrist who, even though they're not there at the moment, they are on call. 
So these are some other resources. These are some free helplines persons can call or text. The first one is Safe Spot, which is for children um, and young persons under the age of 18 years old. So you get free psychosocial support immediately as you text and call. They're very responsive. I work with them as well. Um, we have Umato, which is for persons ages 16 to 24, so young persons, young adults. You can take support or whatever else is going on on Facebook Messenger, on WhatsApp, on DM, via DM, and again, instantaneous support from a trained counselor. And then we have the Ministry of Health hotline. These are psychologists who you can call and reach them. Sometimes you may call and they may not be available, but generally if you leave your name and number, they will return your call. And now personally, what can you do to manage your mental health? So you're not diagnosed with any mental illnesses, but your mental health is still important. So the same way you take steps to ensure that you're physically healthy, you know, you take your vitamins, you drink your water, you take any other medication that you're prescribed, the same way you have to take active steps to promote your mental health. So if you're a, if you're a religious person, you can connect with your spiritual source. You can identify a support system. I usually say, just think of three persons you can turn to when things are rough. And those, those three persons, whenever anything is going on, you should reach out to them. And if you find that they cannot help you, then it's time to seek professional help. Then lifestyle, lifestyle changes. If you're living a sedentary lifestyle, you know, most persons are sitting nowadays, and especially with the pandemic, you need to be more active. Being physically healthy also helps you to be mentally healthy. Find time to meditate, find time to be alone and reflect. Some persons journal, some persons have to do self-care. Self-care, some Nowadays, self-care is turning into, you know, going to the spa, doing the nails, uh, maybe trimming for the men. But it's more than that. It's intentionally taking care of yourself, knowing that it's okay to feel what you're feeling and know that and have steps and have a toolkit where you can take care of yourself when something goes wrong. And rest. Rest is very important. It gives you time off from being a human being from being a human doing to be a human being. And there are different types of rest. You know, we have all these technologies. Sometimes it's good to put on a phone, put, the, put on a laptop, put on the work, and just unplug. Sometimes it's emotional rest. So, you know, people who are draining you work that is draining you, sometimes it's just you just need to step away from that and just be you. I will end the presentation with this short video about mental health. It's okay to struggle with mental health problems. It's not unique to be alone, you know. Everybody experiences struggle. Work stress, marital stress. I struggle with depression and anxiety. Our mind is the gateway to both our spirit and our body. This person should be taking care of their mental state the same way that you take care of your physical state. I also sought professional counseling. And one of the things that I learned from my counselors is that it's most important for you to take care of yourself first. Eating right, exercise, yoga, meditation. It's the rest every day. Give me some fresh air. If it's just like a simple jive out, a simple walk out. So if you're struggling with depression, you should reach out and see a professional to help you go through this problem. You don't have to struggle at all. It's important to take care of your mental health every day. Every day. Every day. Mental health matters. All right. And these are some ways you can contact us. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, and we're on Twitter, jamhan underscore J A. Um, we also have a referral network so people can contact us if they're unsure of any constant services. And we have persons that can, you know, if you talk to us, we can talk to us and let us know what's going on we can direct to some private and public counseling services if you're unaware of any and that is my presentation thank you and thank you miss abigail very interesting i'm just going to give our members <clears throat> a little time to ask some questions if they would like to or make some comments I guess. Yes. Good evening. Okay. Sorry, go. Good evening. go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Good evening. Natalie Harris Mackenzie. Yes. Kiwani Squitter Portmore. Oh, good. 
uh, Ms. Evans. Um, I was querying regarding the information for, um, what, what is it called, safe, safe, safe space. Fun. Yes, for the for the kids, I was unable to see it. Uh, safe space. Yes, I was unable to see it clearly, and I'm very interested in that one for the kids under 19. Okay, so I will send the number in the chat. Um, children are able to call or text Safe Spot, and they get access to counseling. So I'll send it in the chat. Thank you so much. All right, I also want to point out that the founder and director of Jam Han is here as well. That is Janelle Brooks, counseling psychologist, and she will be able to answer some of the questions as well. Um, President Junior. Yes. I, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, I, I saw in the, the slide presentation a referral to catatonic behavior. And I just wanted to find out what is the what is described as catatonic behavior. Uh, Janiel, would you like to take that? Yes, I'm here. Good night. Thank you for having us. Um, quite simply, <laughs> catatonic behavior relates to muscle and limb stiffness. So when persons are unable to move their limbs as fluidly as normal, or they choose to stand up in a very stiff, statue-like kind of way. That's what it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK. Um, hi, good night. This is Ms. Roxanne Daly. I had a question for Ms. Evans. Um, Ms. Evans, based on your interest, is it possible I can ask what had led you to be interested in in basically helping with mental health in Jamaica, reaching out to young persons, what what was that drive that made you decide that this was the field for you? Um, it's just just based on what I saw happening around me. Um, I saw that our population was hurting. I saw that there was a especially with the high crime rate that there was a lot we didn't talk about, especially because we don't like to have people in our business. We, 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 I would say we're strong people, but we hold a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. And it's hard for us to really deal with it. And it's hard for us to really talk about it. So it's within that context and just seeing my friends go through things and family go through things that they felt they were unable to talk about. That's where my interest really, like, um, really came about from. Um, I have a question. Um, the slide on self-care, I believe. I think one of the bullets there speaks to um, spend quiet time alone or something like that. Um, I want you to um, comment on that a little bit more because it, even in light of what you just said, that in certain circumstances you need to talk about the thing. You mm -hmm. need to find a trusted source and to engage. Mm -hmm. rather than become a recluse mm -hmm. so is is that contextual or it depends because i'm thinking in a lot of cases you, you need a listening ear and, and an outlet to engage rather than to be isolated further um can you comment all right. So quiet time is separate from being isolated. So what we ha had through the pandemic, that was isolation. Quiet time just gives you, it is for you to take a moment, think about what you're feeling, think about what you're going through. It doesn't mean you're going to withdraw from other people. It just means that sometimes you need to step back. Maybe you need to process your thoughts. So something happened during the work day, your, your coworker said mm -hmm. something to you and you blow up for some reason. Sometimes in quiet time, they can reflect and see what really happened. Why did I blow up with this coworker? Was it something she said or was it something that was happening within me? And in those quiet times, sometimes we, we now recognize that, okay, we need to get help. So even if you go to a therapist, they would definitely request that you get some quiet time and think about things that are happening in your feelings and process them and even journal. So oh. quiet time is separate and apart from isolation. I have a question, President Junior. Yes, go ahead. Ms. Evans, thank you. Um, I'm curious to know, um, it's easy for people to 
to look at, it's harder for people to look at themselves mm -hmm. and know whether they have a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I noticed you said that if you have three, you should identify three persons who, you know, you can go to, and then if they can't help you, then you know, you, then you should go, then you should seek professional advice. But um, I, can, you, can you go a little bit further in terms of how you know you should be seeking professional advice? Th that's one question. And the other one is third party. What happens when you see somebody, you know, you're not an expert, you're not a mental health expert, mm -hmm. but you think somebody else, maybe a family member, mm -hmm. has a problem? How, how would you suggest one? And maybe they don't want to go to any treatment or any, you know, they don't believe that there is a problem, mm -hmm. but you, you, you see a problem. Mm -hmm. How do you move from that stage to helping them? Or to, because it could all, helping them could also be helping yourself. Right. So. All right. So in terms of recognizing that there's an issue, so it's really person specific, but some general things are, you know, you're preoccupied with certain thoughts and this is affecting your ability to work, to go to school. So when we say you're, you have a problem, it's going to affect your work, it's going to affect your school, it's going to affect your relationships. And you're also going to probably going to be getting comments from other people. So you have to look at your daily life and look at you at your optimal self. And then if you're not that, and if this is continuous, maybe two weeks or more, then at that moment, you need to seek help. And it's really affecting you and affecting your ability to live. As for the next part, in terms of referring your friends to or family member to seek help. So being aware of these signs, so having presentations like these and just doing your own research and getting knowledge about this, then you're able to pinpoint the signs. Then you can speak to that friend, know with this knowledge to say, maybe it's time for you to see someone. And Jenny, um, Jenny you can add anything to that if you wish. More about the signs and times you know you need to seek professional help surely so what you said is correct and i would add when it is that you notice within yourself or a loved one any change in their normal routine or way of being so someone who is normally outgoing and talkative you notice for weeks they're now more withdrawn the converse can be true. Somebody who is normally withdrawn and all of a sudden is more is more outgoing, more talkative, more vivacious. That can also be a sign. So it's going to be individualized based on the person, but it has to then be different from whatever the norm is for you or that person. Um, Ms. Evans, uh, if I can, if I can follow, up, it's really a follow up to what DP Stuart just asked, because when it comes, especially to mental health, Jamaicans on a whole tend to be brutal. So if you're having a mental issue, you don't want anybody to know. So they, so look at it now. DP Stuart is my brother, and I recognize that he's having some mental health issues and he needs help. But I can't convince him to go and see a specialist. What do I do? I mean, I don't have the money to call in a private specialist to come to him. I recognize he, he needs help, but he's saying he, he's fine. He doesn't need any help. How do I go about getting him that help? All right, Jenny, I think you should take that one. Mm -hmm. All right, so this may sound um, discouraging. But the truth of the matter is that if a person is unable or unwilling rather to take help or advice, despite your best efforts, you may not be able to help everyone at the point that you would want to help them at. Um, that's something that us as professional psychologists have to grapple sometimes you know if it's um clients who are sent to us by court order or the parents force them or whatever and they see no problem they want no help they'll sit down there for the whole time and just stare at you it's an unfortunate part of the job that won't be able to save everybody that being said there are cases where things such as involuntary commitment can come in 
if somebody is being volatile or is posing a threat to themselves or others. The Mental Health Act by law does allow that. But what I would say for the persons who are in your life that you're trying to motivate to, you know, get the help is to continue to be patient, to show them the data. So it's not just something that you're making up. You are literally seeing a change in their patterns, in their behavior. Show them, give them everything that you're seeing, express your concern, offer to follow them to the professional, you know, get a list of resources and give it to them. If it's a family situation, you guys can kind of have a family meeting and everyone sit down and express their concerns. You know, it depends on the nature of the situation. But if it comes to a point where the person is still within their decision making faculties, even though it may not be the best decisions that they're making, it's hard to force anything unless they're becoming a threat to themselves or others. Yeah. Thanks, Miss Brooks. Any other questions, comments? I I just have a comment following on on that. Um, I think in that scenario could engage um another party that that person um might be more receptive to, and to use that as a channel. Um, I do um, underscore the need for continued engagement and observation. Um, why being patient, you know, um, building trust. Um, the third thing I would say is um, perhaps instead of going directly to a specialist, maybe just go to a a generalist. Maybe I mean, they, maybe it's not their area but at least you know a general checkup and maybe engage the doctor to say this is what i'm seeing and they could take it from there and maybe you know they would be more receptive to um a professional uh, making an observation and perhaps a referral or perhaps providing some preliminary um sometimes it's depression or mild depression that they may prescribe something for that could help to lift the person preliminarily so that they can be a little bit more yes. focused on what's happening to them yeah so those totally would be agree thank you so much for that um, um president, I president think... junior sorry yes go ahead um no I was just closing up, his, um, emphasizing that point to say that persons sometimes are more receptive to information of that nature coming from a general practitioner rather right. than a psychiatrist because of the stigma when they hear a psychiatrist that automatically um, start to panic and think that, oh, that means I'm crazy. But when it comes from a GP, sometimes it's it's better received. Yes. I, I just had two. Two other little questions, um, President Junior. Yes. Um, I I noticed that no mention was made <clears throat> about what I've always heard um called bipolar a bipolar condition. Um. With with people having highs and lows, so to speak, and um, I don't know if if, if it is relevant as to what part. Could be played by a psychologist as this thing from a psychiatrist who is um uh, the, the, the psychiatrist i gather is a more technical person with the medication and all that but the psychologist would probably deal with the the viewpoints of the person having the the, the issues yeah. I, I just wanted to to have a comment from um, Abigail, Anita, or Janine, I don't mm -hmm. So I will start off and Janine can finish. Okay. All right, so the ones we discuss in the presentations are the ones that are most prevalent in Jamaica. We're not saying that, you know, there are in some cases of bipolar disorder um, with highs and lows. So there are different types. So there are some persons who um, would have... Uh, 
a lot of highs. So at those times, uh, they feel very high spirited. They will engage in reckless behavior. They may drink, they may smoke. And then sometimes they may be really low where they're really depressed and they can't, you know, function in their normal life. Um, so there are some cases, but it's not as prevalent as the others mm -hmm. that are mentioned in the presentation, at least that are diagnosed in Jamaica. So that's why those were mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of, uh, I don't remember your next question. The psychologist. The, oh, okay. The, the role of a psychologist in the whole. All right, so as you mentioned, yes, the psychiatrists um, do prescribe medication. And sometimes they do work in a team with each other. Sometimes it's a psychologist, psychiatrist working together. It's a whole team of services, but Jenny can go deeper into what um, she does as a psychologist. So. A psychologist would <clears throat> do engage in indiv individual group or couples counseling. So we do talk therapy. Well, psychiatrists are medical doctors and they can diagnose and prescribe. So psychologists can diagnose as well, but the prescription part has to be done by the psychiatrist and it comes down to medication management. Some psychiatrists do talk therapy too, but not, not, very, not very many here in Jamaica do it. They mainly manage the symptoms and the medication. Yes. Okay, I have, I have a quick one. Um, it's not uncommon for people to comment that people who, as they get older, they get more miserable. And I'm just wondering if, is that a normal, is there a normal relationship between that and aging? Or is that something that could be considered more serious in terms of your mental health? All right, so it's not necessarily an, an, a normal part of aging. It just depends on what's going on in a person's <clears throat> life. So is it that, okay, so when, even when, when I mentioned dementia before and certain risk factors, so, you know, as you get older, you probably retire, right? And that can tend to make you miserable. And that's also a risk factor for dementia. You're not being mentally stimulated. So you're not really using your brain. And that can cause dementia to develop a bit earlier. And then sometimes with the family support, you know, some people see older person as a bother, something, some persons to take care of, you know, maybe not contributing as much anymore. So with older person, they can become isolated. They feel they feel like they're not getting any support from people around them. They may feel alone. They may feel not, they may feel not as understood anymore. And I even remember my research I was doing with the team and we did a, a study with some older persons and a lot of them reported that they felt lonely they did not feel as supported by their families and this is what they're feeling so it's a, a number of things that may contribute to a, a older person become miserable as you speak thank you <laughs> interesting <laughs> <laughs> any other question comment <laughs> very interesting Good evening again. Yes, go ahead. As an educator, Ms. Evans, I, I do have some concerns, and I don't know if your organization um, does any, any work at all in schools, you know, but based on what we see happening on, and I'm not going to blame the pandemic because some of it was going on before the pandemic where um, because of the, the thrust towards um, this whole integration where um, you have students of different caliber be brought into a so-called normal school environment and expected to perform or operate with the normal kids in the normal classroom, we find that, you know, we cannot diagnose the illnesses missed, but from and having, you know, been teaching for some years, you can readily see that there are some who, they're not operating as who we call normal children. And sometimes when we do speak to the parents, they can attest to certain behaviors, even though they have not done any in-depth um, 
therapy with the child to find out exactly what the professionals have to say. So I'm just asking if there's any work that your organization do in schools, um, you know, in conjunction with the Ministry of Education to, in this regard, because in the schools we do need help with some of these children and that's one of the proven reasons why education is not on some of their minds even though they turn up for school every day because they are not able to process and to 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 understand as they should in order for you to see active learning taking place mm -hmm. all right so we don't necessarily work in schools um we do media we do social media campaigns and different campaigns surrounding different topics about mental health but jenny you can correct me if i'm wrong um, I'm not sure if we've done any campaigns in school, but I will say, but you as an educator will be seeing this more. I know the ministry recently have installed some, um, well, they're trying to train up teachers to be more aware of mental health concerns and how to address them. And I, and I even believe they train up some students to be able to recognize mental health concerns. Um, but that is definitely the purview of the Ministry of Health. But we do try to raise awareness. Uh, we do try to speak to people like yourself to get information out there. Um, so eventually the <clears throat> ministry can take notice of what's going on. Well, I think uh, listening to the conversation this evening, it is just underscoring for me this um, grave need for more resources or just highlighting or oh, there is such lack of resources in terms of even guidance counseling facilities and even those who are accessing whatever institutions that are available there's still not enough or well resourced to, to re treat with um i love a comment from the presenters on this um there's been over the last the few you know recent years this push towards more community-based, home-based care. Um, personally, I think that is just government trying to <clears throat> take on responsibility, quite frankly, because they haven't resourced the system properly. But that being said, and with all the positives that may come from um, familiar environment for care, I'm not hearing sufficiently, if at all, um, any resourcing uh, and support um, and assessment for those who are, are required to give the care, which are out of family members. In a modern day 21st century scenario where everybody are go work, are go school, who really is available to properly care for someone in the home setting with all of its positive you know, theoretical comments about the benefits of it. But practically, I'm not hearing within the system or from the ministry, et cetera, what tangible day, every day, every week type of support and resources that would come <laughs> of those persons to provide such home care. So I'd love to hear the presenters comment on that or, uh, on my observation all right so i will start off um the approach to having a community health based intervention to some of these concerns it's on a basis that okay so yes someone can go to counseling especially for children they can go to counseling but if their environment is still reinforcing that type of behavior then whatever the counselor is doing it can only help so much so it's going to take the effort of the family and the counselors to to really make a difference so with the counseling generally they do speak to parents, the parents of the children, to, to ensure that everyone's on the same page when the counselor is speaking to the child and then when the counselor is speaking to the parents, because it's going to take the whole family to intervene in this child's life. As for the day-to-day -day interventions from the ministry, that, yes, that is lacking. You, Jamaica is very reactive. We tend to be reactive than preventative. So... That is something that needs to be addressed. 
and unfortunately that is still a work in progress right. um and it's really up to the individual to seek out the care um, as i mentioned there are mental health clinics so if you do realize that you know you need to see someone you know there are different clinics you can go to as i mentioned the hotlines that are present um, present they are free of cost and they have trained counselors there as well that is one way they're trying to ensure that there is real-time interventions and if you can afford it then there are private counseling um, services so that's there's a range in cost so some are affordable some may be expensive but it all depends on your budgetary concerns mm -hmm. and i know we have to wrap but um just a quick one president yes yes you're um right, you, you you said you have done a, a lot of research but with one part one type of research i would like to know if you have done anything on is is there any research on the effect of ganja ganja smoking and mental health all right, Janiel, would you like to comment on that one? We as an organization have not conducted that research, but the National Council on Drug Abuse has all of their research studies are on the website. So they are the government, they're now a quasi government agency and they're responsible for dealing with substance misuse. So they have a whole host of studies and researches that they have done on all of the substances and how they affect young people the prevalence mm. of how many people are using and so on the national council on drug abuse okay thank you uh, president, uh, president uh, junior can i ask one last question yes thank you um your slide miss evans your slide i think if i remember correctly said something like 30 percent of 30% of Jamaicans suffer some sort of mental issue. Um, I remember some long time ago, a head of the Bellevue Hospital had done a research that said it was like, I think he had quoted like 60 something percent Jamaicans and, and they nearly killed him for it at the time. To tell you the truth, my, my experience um, over the last couple of years is that I believe it's closer to the 60% than the 30%. Um, you know, I, I just want your take on that because I have come across some people that they, they seem normal like me, and I'm pretty sure even some people might think something wrong with me. And <laughs> and then I realized that you know they, they actually do it. it we think health issues is just schizophrenia, but there's a whole lot of other health issues. And I, so yeah. I kind of believe it's closer to the sixty percent. What's your view on that? Mm -hmm. All right, so I believe the slide you're referring to is about 30% for depression right. um, with these numbers. So they can only report on what they're seeing. So these are the percentage that are actually going into the clinics, uh, going into the public health services, and that's what they're reporting on. So with other cases that are undiagnosed and they're, that they're not seeking help, uh, then we can't really speak to that. Yeah, so in our experience, yes, we would believe that there's a larger, there's a more sub, a larger subset of population that are experiencing mental health challenges. But with the numbers, you know, it's whoever are going into the public services yeah. um, that we can't really speak on. But we do know that the numbers are not exactly representative at, of what is currently happening. Yes. All right, I know we could go on and on and on with this. Very interesting. But um, I'm going to be allowing two more questions. Two more questions if we have any other or comment. We may have comment or question. Any other question? Um, it's not a question, um, Sir President. Yes. Um, Melissa Lucasta from Guys Hill, are you hearing me? We are. Yes, just to say, sir, that um, it's, it has been a very informative session. I wanted to add that um, when the gentleman was asking the questions about the schools, just to add that um, the Ministry of Education, in collaboration with the Ministry of Health, <clears throat> is, is um, conducting um, trainings with our HFLE officers, guidance counselors, and nurses in the high schools at present to deal with the mental health situation in schools right. because of the various challenges that, that we see happening now in our high schools with mental health and our children. So just a statement, I wanted to add that there is some level of collaboration at yeah. present, sir. Yeah, right. very important. 
Um, sorry, Millicent, is this the initiative that was announced recently on Mental Health, uh, World Mental Health Day? Yes, and at present we are, uh, we are going into some training next week, the 25th to the 28th. Um, we're going to be working with regions three, four, and five, mm -hmm. and then another another set of regions with the, with those persons that are identified. Um, those persons that are identified, the nurses, the HFLE, mm -hmm. um, HFLE um, teachers, and the guidance counselors. And you know, we are training them with some of the same information that you have. Yes. And we're also so you know, this is so timely that you have that that Mr. President. Yeah. as you know is doing this workshop with you and our key clubbers are in the meeting because okay. this is a kind of collaboration that is well needed and we're really grateful that you came this afternoon so just to, to add some support to what you you said right <laughs> thank, you. thank you um mr president this is pe letner from toronto caribbean right. uh thank you for having me on your meeting uh I came in late, but what I heard was very informative. But my question, uh, mental health is a situation that is happening all over the world. We're in Canada here, we are faced with mental health, especially when white people do anything, it's a mental health thing. And when black people do anything, they just, they say they're criminals and decide to incarcerate them, right? But yeah. do we, <laughs> do we, do we really know the root cause of mental health in, in students in Jamaica, because when I went to school in Jamaica, and, and I'm sure I went to school with a lot of you online here, um, we weren't faced with mental health situation. We were disciplined, teachers spoke to us, we adhered to them, we adhered to our parents, we didn't have the free reign of going to the malls and, 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 and going all over school dismiss, you know, you go home. No right. school dismiss people are all over the place and they don't they don't reach home until X hours a night when as my grandmother said when dog freed. Okay. That's when students are reaching home. So one of the things that I'd like I'd like for the Q1 is to do with especially with our children as you counsel them, um, is to find out what is the root cause of the of of, of the mental the root cause of how they're feeling and why they're feeling the way they're feeling. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it starts from the home where, where children are being neglected by their parents. Um, I mean, in Canada, yeah, people are doing three, four jobs to keep roof on the, over the head and food on the table. Um, mm -hmm. I know in Jamaica, there are some people who are doing two, three, four jobs and mothers are going back to school and all of that and children are being neglected. So we need to find the root cause from the children on an individual basis. And when we get those root costs on an individual basis, it becomes confidential information. A student who is not afraid to come and talk to a teacher or to a guidance counselor or to the school nurse because they know somebody is going to tell them about it. So it has to be, we have to sign, they have to sign that, that confidentiality agreement when they're employed in the, in, in, in the organization, the schools that deal with these mental health cases. So we need to find the root cause of mental health and treat it from the root. Okay. Your right. comment on this again. Um, yes, um, President Lorna, you are completely right. Especially as you mentioned with children, they, they often feel like adults, their parents, they don't listen because th there's a view that children don't have real feelings. You're not working. All you have to do is go to school. So you don't really have no problem. But that is not true. They're experiencing all these kind of problems, especially with how the world is nowadays, bullying, peer pressure, and everything that they're seeing in the environment. So they do have problems and parents have to create an environment where it's okay for children to speak to you whenever these things are happening. And in yeah. terms of confidentiality, confidentiality is a tenet of any counseling services. So the guidance counselor should be keeping it confidential. Psychologists are definitely keeping it confidential. So um, that's not something we only, it's only broken when, you know, there's a risk to um, harm to yourself or to other people, really. Right. Thank you. And that's a good way of ending our discussion if there's nothing more to discuss at this time. but. I know we could just go on and on and on. There are so many questions. In fact, there are probably more questions than answers in this particular subject. All right, at this time, if there are no other pressing questions or comments, I'll just ask. Mm -hmm.
I somebody has a raise hand, President Julian. Oh, somebody. All right, I just allow that. Just one raise hand in the in the in it. Hi. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, PE, you really see here again. Hi. Um, just to add to what um President Lechner was stuck when just yes. stated. I was in a conference just this week, about yesterday, um, or it's today's Tuesday, perhaps yesterday, anyways, that's irrelevant. Yeah. And um, it appears that the study is shaping up to say that since the world is probably in a perpetual state of trauma and these constant traumatic events that we are engaged in, is a definite um, um, breeding of the the this um, mental situation. Additionally, um, trauma and and um, perpetual traumatic um, behaviors or absorption then also goes into the genetics. It change the genotype of the individual. So while P. E. Um, President Lechner was growing up in a more calm, docile time when, when there was not so many traumatic events, if somebody, um, you know, hit somebody back then, you talk about it for, for years, you know, remember when, but nowadays they happen so frequently right. that you know there is no remember when when you're talking about this event somebody might be saying oh no one happened yesterday and oh. so this now gets into the genotype of the individual so perhaps if you look at um president letner's gene from her grandmother and what she has now and then looking at her grandchildren the genotype is completely different because trauma has changed what it looked like okay. and not because the the the, in the, the current um generation had experienced it but it's what was absorbed into the generation prior that perpetuates the situation so it's a big study going on right. and um so i just like to add that that you know it's yeah. it's it's really into the gene now and that's why the events are so much more frequent and so much more riveting because okay. the genes has changed all right abigail i'd like you to if you want to respond to that i'll be last stop on that yeah go ahead all right so uh i don't remember the name but she does have a point um yeah. So especially for children, when their brains are so malleable, we call it plastic, when it's always changing. So that's why they encourage you to, you know, you know, push a lot of positive information, you know, have them be learning at that time. So when children experience trauma, their brains literally alter because of this trauma. So a child who's been raised in a positive, fulfilling environment with loving parents, as opposed to a child who's been in a negative environment with parents who are neglectful in a violent environment, they're their outcomes are going to look very different. Their brains are going to be look they're very different. So it's it's going to take more for that child who is in that environment to even learn at school. Maybe a teacher really have to look at them and take them under their wing, or maybe another family member really has to take them under their wing. But trauma does literally alter the brain. There's a lot of studies about that. Okay, and thank you very much. Thank you all very much for the input. Quite a bit of input. And as I've said before, we could go all night with this one. So I'm going to call on Director Director um, David. All, are you there, David? To give the vote. Right here, time. right here. Yes, my Thank you, President. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. So on behalf of our president and the board, um, Ms. Evans it has certainly been our pleasure Can listening you. to you this evening. Your bio started us by keeping us listening to what you're going to say, but then your appearance on the screen kept us riveted to also look at you. I noticed some of the Kiwanians turned their cameras on while they were speaking, and normally their cameras are off. So obviously, 
they want to engage you as much as they could in your topic, the state of mental health care in Jamaica. Um, it, so many great points came out that um, it just kept us enthralled. Mental health is just as important as our physical health. And I mean, you might have heard that before, but you certainly reinforced it. And then we listened to you and the song from Michael Jackson, I believe, that um, the man in the mirror, right. um, you caused us to look at that grid that you were giving us um, that started off on the blue. And I, I saw some eyes um, look worried when you started to analyze moving over to mild, moderate, um, distressed to mental illness on the orange side. Uh, and, and some of us wanted to look and see where we were. But I think you caused us not only to look inward, but to look outward. And the definition that you gave um, certainly brought out that discussion this evening. And then I think you left us with some great points. Um, when to ask for help, that testimonial was very um, enlightening for us to think. And then what, um, who to go to for help. Uh, we need that information. And then how to develop our own self-care plan. I, I, I thought it was um, very interesting, very good, very informative. So on behalf of our president, President Junior, the board and the members of the Kiwan School of Kingston, um, it is my pleasure to thank you. And you're also supported by Janil, Janil Brooks, thank you very much. But on behalf of the Kiwan School of Kingston, it's my pleasure to present you this virtual certificate and to say thank you very much. And the question certainly showed that you had the members and our visitors totally engaged. Thank you again. And we look forward to having you back with us in the future to analyze us and see how we have improved from where we are today. Thank you very much. Yeah. And we will, we will try and get the certificate to you, uh, Abigail. Thank you. And thank you, thank you, uh, Director Davis. That was so, so good. And thank you, ladies, for coming and thank you for presenting. And thank all, all of us for participating. It was a quite an interesting discussion. And we have learned quite a bit, I must say. Um, Sarge, are you there? I am. You are. I hope I, you're taking note. You can, okay, you can hear me, and can you see me? I'm not see. I'm not seeing you, but I'm hearing you. Hearing is good enough. Here, good evening, everyone, and thank you, President Junior. Yes. I sat and listened to the very interesting presentation this evening, and hearing of the lack of resources just underscored for me this uh, the lack of charges. Yeah. So with Christmas fast approaching, I will aim to be more giving. So with no doubt, my giving will help with your mental health. <laughs> so I'm going to start with a grudge charge. This is from the last board meeting, but unfortunately I, I forgot the last time I was here, but I remember now. Okay. So, so as not to trip up on the Kiwanian alphabet, I'll just refer to him as Kiwanian Dalma. For yeah. the incorrect name for President Junior, yeah. right? $200. Yeah. So I haven't forgotten. Last week, I came on at 8.16. Unfortunately, the meeting was done, but I had sent a message to a particular member right. and they did not apologize on my behalf. Right, Sir Stewart? They did or did? He did not, hmm. right, Sir Stewart? Because, because I didn't see it in time. <laughs> well, Sir Stewart, I, I don't check my WhatsApp during the meetings. <laughs> not my fault. $300 for that charge, but so oh, oh, oh. It's a meeting flyer. So I'm going to call it double bubble to the f this week for you. So $600 for you this week. Sir, we have right? For the wrong account number for the payment of due. That is very crucial, Sir Willie. I can't believe you did that. So that's $300 yeah. for you. Right? Wow. And our TV celebrity, Major Richard Reese. TV celebrity without any promotion of the club, $300. Yeah. Right? <laughs> And Sir Warren McDonald, for all your videos, there's a video tax of $300. Yeah. 
an open mic night tonight, but it was so for your open mic night, three hundred dollars. PB Newton, whose anxiety I think is what resulted in no early responses, three hundred dollars as well. And yes. in an attempt to be proactive, as opposed to being reactive, Chairman Martino, I don't know what it is I'm charging you for, but three hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you. President Junior. Yes, sir. We need a report from the side as to what percentage of the of the fees are being collected. Um yes. we, we, I, I don't know. But yes. can he tell us it is not for collection? So in, in the job description, uh, it yes. was not to the chair that I was supposed to be monitoring that. So I guess maybe right. somebody should get a charge for that as well. All right, we work on that. All right. We work on that one. All right. Thank you again. So you uh, tell me that all these charges were not being collected. Don't worry, I have records of them. Yes, so, please do. Please do. All right. Yes. Okay. Notices and announcements. DLG Willie, you have some for us? Yes, thank you, President Junior. Right. Regarding our notices, the Back to School Supply Drive joint with Michael Circle K and Nation Builders K1, Nation Builders Kingston is ongoing. Yes. More importantly, this Saturday, well, okay, one is, listen. Listen. As part of the Division National Tree Planting mm. Project, we will be doing a joint project with Kiwanis Pueblo Nation Builders Kingston, and as well as to our SLP, St. Hugh's Key Club, and Michael University College. We meet at St. Hugh's mm. at 10. Plant to plant four trees and then we move over to Michael, at which time we will plant another four trees. So that is Saturday morning, 10 o'clock, St. Hughes, rounds of St. Hughes. Now, on so next Sunday, October 23rd, yes. our joint installation, Big Club, Kingston, West St. Andrew and young professional St. Andrew. <clears throat> the place at the police officers club at four o'clock. Now, Kiwanis, I need to know by tomorrow if you will be attending to meet the installation physically, because we want to make proper arrangements with the caterers, because following the function, we will be having bigger food and drinks. So it's important. I have a number of Kiwanis who already communicated with me that they will be there present physically. Uh, they would all, it was going to be a hybrid meeting, but we didn't want to advertise the fact there was a hybrid meeting until soon near to the day. Yeah. But those who definitely cannot attend, we will send out the details for the hybrid meeting. Now, Last announcement is on next Monday. We will have a Christmas ball committee meeting again at my home. 52 Haley Crescent starts at 6 p.m. So a decision will have to be taken. Wasn't it when you put the bear right there? What? Wasn't it when you put the bear right there? Honey, I, I didn't see that. Which and now carry the bear down. Who was drinking bear? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Your mic. If you see out, we're going to have to find, you know, for drinking beer. <laughs> in the meeting. <laughs> hello, hello K1. Go again, go again, go again, DLG with it. Hello, K1. Particularly members of the Christmas Ball Committee meeting, there will be a uh, committee, Christmas Ball committee, Planning Committee. There will be a meeting at my house uh, next week, Monday at 6 o'clock. To continue with the planning for the Christmas ball. There are still a number of outstanding matters which need to be 
looked at and addressed. Right. But so far, the it is it is going to be held at the Pegasus, the Pegasus Hotel <coughs> on Saturday, December three, and the price is fifteen thousand dollars. And in I terms must... of interclub, in terms of interclubbing opportunities, I will send out the details in the morning as to which clubs we can visit this the rest of this week. Okay. So, importantly, national tree planting, Saturday morning, St. Hughes, 10 o'clock, our joint installation along with the West St. Andrew and Young <coughs> Festival, St. Andrew, on Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock, the cost is 2500 Right. So far, the cheapest installation. At least October 24th. We have the Christmas Ball Committee meeting. That's Monday yes. at 6 p.m. in my book. Those are the announcements for now, uh, President Junior. Yeah. Thank you, sir. You Thank may you want to invite you. people from the floor if they have any announcements. Thank right. you. Good. Are there any the announcements? President Junior? Yes. Director Roy from the Q Honest Club of Toronto Caribbean. Oh, and, a and a former Kinston member. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just announcing that. Um, sorry, <laughs> am I, I just recovered from COVID. Sorry. <laughs> so my voice is different here. On Friday the 22nd, we are going to be having our induction and installation ceremony. 21st. 21st, sorry. Oh, that's yeah. Friday coming. Sure. Um, we are going to, we are inviting members of the Kiwanis Club of Kinson to attend. The yeah. guest speaker would be um, MPP, the member of the provincial parliament, Mitzi Hunter, and she's a Jamaican. Okay. And congratulations, um, President Junior, on your being president, and I wish you a successful year. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, President Junior, if I want to reiterate what Director Roy just says, uh, just to let you know that uh, our guest speaker for the night, uh, MPP Mitzi, Mitzi Hunter, a uh, member of the provincial party, we have three different uh, parliament, of party. parliament here. We have the federal, those are MPs, we have the provincial, right. the MPP, and then we have the councillors. Local, yes. Oh, Mitzi Hunter, uh, left Jamaica, come to Canada when she was three. She came to Canada when she was three. And then she went back home and um, graduated from Meadowbrook High School. <coughs> so if there's any Meadowbrook um, alma mater on, online here, it will be good to see and hear her speak. Good. As our only, no, not the only black one, but the longest serving black member uh, member of parliament, MPP for Ontario. Okay. And she run for the leadership too. And she's now the deputy leader of the uh, the Liberal Party of Ontario. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Chairman Roy, you send me the link. For you. Send yeah. Me the link for you. I can... Yeah, we sent it out to Cyber. It's on Cyber Connect, really? but I sent it to you, Willie. Yeah, send it personally. Yeah. Yeah. Please do send it to us. For the correct date. Ah. Is. <laughs> thank you thank you it's awesome. february 21st at 7 p.m no not february <laughs> <laughs> october <laughs> <laughs> is it's director friday. right to that direct friday coming, friday coming. <laughs> it's friday it's on friday <laughs> yes right so read it to me <laughs> at 7 p.m our time oh yeah, 7 p.m. Well, Canadian right time, which is 6 p.m. Time. Time. Daylight saving time. One hour ahead, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Any other? No? All right. Um, DP Stewart? Okay. Yes, Your President. Thought of the week, <laughs> usually thoughts. <laughs> Yeah, you see, I had opened my mic because I knew I was going to be on next. 
And then my granddaughter had a question, you know. <laughs> if, you were, if you were drinking the rum, you were the one. <laughs> yeah, I was drinking any beer. I, I drink I drink beer, you know, only sorrel beer. That's the only beer oh, I drink. Yeah. But I wasn't drinking any. Anyhow, let me um get on to my thoughts. This one is a Thomas Edison quote. It says, many of life's failures are men. And I noticed he said men, because I guess at that time, you know, it was all about men. Right. But, I, but it's, you could use it as a gender neutral com, um, term. Who did not realize how close they were to success when yeah. they gave up. And yeah. that is a, that's, that's the quote by Thomas Edison. <clears throat> and then we have another one, kind of on a similar theme. It says, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. So those are my two thoughts for the week, President Juno. Very good thoughts as usual. I think I heard the first one before. Mm -hmm. but yes, very please. good. Very, very, very good. Okay, if there's nothing else to discuss in this meeting, we'll just raise a toast to Kiwanis International and Friendly Jamaica. Our Jamaica land we love. I have my <laughs> right. So if there's nothing more to discuss, then we will adjourn this meeting. Terminate. 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 Why we keep putting we'll adjourn then? Because I'm really terminate. We'll terminate. Yeah. And, and we'll change it. We'll change the agenda to terminate. And thank you all for coming and thank you all for participating. Gentlemen, I see you've trained Director Roy very well. Yes. <laughs> He's the epitome of a real Kiwanian and he keeps us <laughs> on our feet. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you, you Willie. Thank, thank you. Thank you. He was a good interclubber. Oh, yeah. Yes. Let's uh, uh, one. Can yeah. you um, terminate? Terminate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, have, stop, we have. We have terminated. Stop the recording. Yeah. I hope I can find it. Okay. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not seeing it either. Uh, well, it's another you, good. You can continue talking. So it's my, not a problem. My, my computer's frozen on me. See. Yeah. Okay. Let me keep looking for it. <laughs> Mine almost ran out of um charge. <laughs> I oh, told you. Gentlemen, I learned from the best. Right. Yeah. Raleigh? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not seeing the full menu for the, um, to stop the recording. Yeah, neither am I. Until the Christmas.